apologize for my voice this morning. I don't seem well under the best of times, and with this congestion, I sound like I'm going through the voice change again. <laughs> Our scripture this morning comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. This was written some 700 years before the birth of Christ. And before we read, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, and as we come to read it this day, we ask that you would bless it to our understanding, that understanding it, we may take it to heart and believe it, and to believe it, we may be doers of it. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray, amen. Isaiah chapter 9, starting with verse 1. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed. As when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan and the Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every warrior's sandal, and from the noisy battle, and garments rolled in blood, will be used for burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a child is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice, from that time forward and evermore, forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be unto God. A man was driving down the road and noticed a hitchhiker. It was a little odd because the hitchhiker had a cow with him. So intrigued, the man stopped and said, You know, I could give you a ride, but I don't think I could fit your cow in the car. But the fellow and the hitchhiker said, Well, that's all right. He said, I'll just tie the cow to the, the bumper of your car. And said, She'll keep up with you. She won't even slow you down. And so intrigued, the man said, Well, okay, we'll give it a try. So they tied the cow to the bump of the car, the hitchhiker got in, and they started off about 10 miles an hour. The cow kept up five. So the man increased to 15 and 20 and then 25 miles an hour and looked back and the cow was still just clopping away, fine to be. So the man sped up again, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50 miles an hour. Each time he looked back, the cow was just running happily along. And so this made the man a little mad that a cow could keep up with his car. And he decided that he'd see just how fast this cow could go. And by the end, he was going about 90 miles an hour. He looked back, and the cow was still keeping up, but its tongue was sticking out of its mouth. And so he kind of rejoiced and smugly said, Well, I believe your cow is getting a little tired now. And the hitchhiker said, Why? And he said, Well, its tongue is sticking out. And the hitchhiker said, Well, which way is her tongue sticking out? To the left or the right? And the man looked back and said, To the left. And the hitchhiker smiles and all, and she's okay, she's just signaling she's getting ready to pass you. <laughs> I guess you could say that's a cow that can keep the promise, because the uh, promise the cow wouldn't slow them down, and they sure did. As far as keeping promises, though, people are not very good at keeping promises. Uh, politicians are particularly well known for not keeping promises. In fact, it is a point of law made in a court just a few years ago that politicians legally do not have to keep their promises. Uh, some politician had made a promise, and uh, when they didn't fulfill it, people sued them. And the court said, basically, a politician can say whatever they want to, and they don't have to fulfill any of it. Now, if that was you or me, you know, uh, we don't uh, keep a promise. They'd throw us under the jail and throw the key away. But the politician is not so much. But one that we can always count on to keep his word and promise is, of course, the Lord God Almighty. In the Bible, we can see that God makes promise after promise. It is one of the main things that he does, is make promises. And when you count those promises, you get different numbers depending on what you consider a promise or not. 
But the most bandied about number uh, is somewhere around 3,600 promises that God makes in the Bible. And what the Bible does is that it shows us that God keeps each and every one of those promises. God will do it in His time and His will and His way, not ours. That's one thing we need to remember. But God does fulfill each promise, each in its time, according to His sovereign will. Now the promises that God makes run from the mundane uh, to the extraordinary. Uh, and a lot of them are promises that the world would consider crazy or impossible. We know, of course, the story, for example, of Abraham and Sarah and the crazy promises that God made to them. That a 90-year-old man and woman could have a child, that's crazy. But God promised and God delivered. They did have a child. I guess you'd say Sarah delivered. They had a child. Uh, God promised them that they would dwell in the land that he was going to give to them. That was crazy. They were just a nomadic couple that they should inherit this land. But God promised, and it was so. And their descendants live there to this very day. God promised that he would bless those who bless them and curse those who curse them. Crazy promise. You know, who are they that God should especially look after them? But if you look at God's people down through the history, what has happened? What happened to those who have cursed God's people? To the Romans, to the Tsarist Russians, to the Nazis, to the Soviets. Each in their turn they passed away. What has happened to those who have blessed God's people? I think probably Great Britain and America have been among the greatest of those who have tried to bless God's people. And I think they've been blessed in turn. We can look and see that God has kept every promise, no matter how crazy it may have seemed. His greatest promise is that all the world would be blessed through them. And again, that sounds crazy. Who were they? They weren't a king and queen. They weren't rich and powerful. But through them indeed, in Christ Jesus, their descendant, the world has been blessed. And so we can look and see in the scripture that God fulfills promises and makes these amazing, world-stopping salvations and promises come true over and over. Just to name a few names, we can look in the lives of Noah and Moses and Joshua and Hannah and Elijah and David and Esther and all the apostles. God made promises and God kept promises to each and every one of them. Probably one of the most beautiful promises that the Lord has made is the one that we see this day uh, in the scripture we read from Isaiah. It's what's known as a messianic prophecy. It's a prophecy made hundreds of years before Christ was born, but which promised a coming redeemer. That's what God promised, that he would save the world, and he would do so through a redeemer who would come. Uh, through a Messiah, which means the Anointed One, which is also what Christ means. You know, some people think Christ is Jesus' last name, but it's not. It's His title. He's the Anointed One. And all of these prophecies, you know, are kind of like strokes of a painting. Each one adds to a portrait of who this Messiah would be. And taken together, they present a pretty specific picture. And when we look, the picture comes out to be Jesus. Uh, there are some who take only bits and pieces of that painting and see what they want to see, and thus they maybe have chosen others who have failed, or they reject Jesus, who is truly the only one who could fulfill all of those prophecies that have been made. In fact, there was a statistician by the name of Stone who took just eight of the hundreds of Messianic prophecies, Eight that dealt with where the Messiah was to be born, how they were to be born, what their ministry would be like, how they would be rejected and betrayed, and how they would die and rise again. And these eight prophecies out of the hundred, this statistician tried to figure what were the odds of anybody fulfilling. And the odds of any one person in all of history fulfilling just these eight came out to be one in one quadrillion. But Jesus fulfilled all eight of them. And Jesus fulfilled hundreds more besides that. And so we can see, statistically speaking, that Christ is the only one who has ever done that. And he is now the only one who truly ever could. And so God keeps his promises in wonderful and mighty ways and does so in ways that show us clearly that uh, this is what he's doing. This passage from Isaiah speaks to us about the Messiah and tells us you know, the Messiah and, and about his being born, about what his character would be and what his rule ultimately would be, would be. 
uh, tells us that people who lived in darkness would see a great light. And it mentions two tribes there. The two tribes that are mentioned are tribes that lived in Galilee, which it also mentions as Galilee of Gentiles. That is where the light would first come, we are told. Well, where was it that Jesus began his ministry? But in Galilee. Remember they said, what good can come out of Nazareth? And remember they said of his followers, well, they're a bunch of Galileans. What do they know? He began his ministry among the outcast in the backwater of a backwater. And the Bible said it 700 years before he did it. It tells us that he would be a child who would be born, and born of Mary he was. But also a child who would be given. A child given by God the Father. It shows both his divine and human nature. It goes on to tell us that he would break the rule of tyrants. And he has done so, continues to do so. I think it was uh, the abolitionist, I forget who it was that ran the paper, back here in the Civil War, but he said that uh, nobody can read the Bible and be a slave for very long. And that's true. If you read, it is a liberating word. And so the whips and tortures of tyrants are broken by this one who was promised to come. It tells us that there will be no limit to the healing and wholeness that he will bring. It shows us what his titles would be. His title would be Wonderful Counselor, one whose wise rule would know no equal, that he would be the Prince of Peace, under whom all conflict would end. It says that the bloody sandals and clothes of those caught up in conflict would be rolled up and piled up and burned because they would be needed no more. Peace would come. We are told that he is no mere human because his titles also include Everlasting Father and Mighty God. And of course, Jesus is God the Son. The Lord, it tells us, does not speak these words just to say them, but backs them up in the strongest terms possible. It calls him the Lord of hosts. That means the commander of all the armies of heaven, all the millions of angels that exist. And the Lord commands them. This commander-in-chief, it says, tells us that he is most anxious that these prophecies come true, and he ensures that they will come true, it says, by his own personal zeal. He puts his own seal that he personally will make sure these come to pass. And so it basically means even if the rest of the world passes away, you can count on these promises that will come true. God in his zeal has promised many things, and he has kept his promises. And just as he kept them to Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Moses and Hannah and Elisha and David and Esther, so too he will keep his promises to us, no matter how crazy they may sound. His promises that he will never leave us or forsake us, that he is always in our midst, that he will heal us and make us whole, that he will be with us no matter what comes our way, that he will see to us, that he does hear our prayers, and that he does answer. All the promises of God are for us. And he says that he, by his own seal, promises he will keep them. But even now in Christmas, we celebrate, of course, the first coming of the Lord. But we also look to the second coming, which will fulfill all his promises in completeness. We live, as I said before, in a time of already, but not yet. We know that peace is coming, but we can look around us and see that there is no peace in the world. But that does not mean that God's promise is void. We can experience that peace first in our hearts. And the Lord, when he comes, will bring that peace finally and foremost to the world when he comes in completeness. And so we need to live our lives now in that love and justice and peace and light and truth that the Lord gives to us, even as we look to the promise of His coming, knowing that just as surely as the sun rises, that God has kept His promise before, and He will keep them to us again. And so the Redeemer has come. The Redeemer abides with us still. And we look to the sky for the Redeemer's coming again. Let us celebrate by living in His life let us pray. Lord, we thank you for all of your promises. We thank you that Christmas time shows you keep your promise. 
what is the birth of the Messiah that we celebrate. We thank you for the promises that sustain our life now and for your promises which sustain our hopes for the future. And we thank you for your word which shows us that you are as good as your word, that you will keep each and every one. And so, Lord, we place our faith in you, place your joy and peace in us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.